That's her room, right there, Mrs. Gellis said, pointing to the door at the end of the hall before retreating to the kitchen. I could tell from the red rings around her eyes that she had been crying. I walked over to the door and lightly rapped on it with my knuckles. Hannah? I called out. My name's Dr. Morgan. Your mother asked me to come over and talk to you? Go away, Hannah slurred. She sounded half asleep. If you don't talk to me, I'll be forced to have you remanded to a behavioral health facility. I hated using that as a treatment, but I didn't think anything else would get through to her befuddled mind. The door swung open a few moments later. Standing before me was a ragged-looking teenage girl, who seemed to be heavily sedated. I'll die if you do that, she said, unable to keep her eyes focused on me as she spoke. Why do you think that? I asked, squeezing past her to enter the bedroom. She shut the door behind me and dragged her feet across the room before falling onto her bed and climbing under the covers not bothering to answer my question. While she got situated, I took a moment to look around her room. As far as I could tell, it looked like the room of a typical teenager. I didn't see anything to indicate the girl was depressed or suicidal, as her mother seemed to think. Plus, she wouldn't be worrying about dying if she were planning on killing herself. Something else was clearly troubling the poor girl. What have you been taking? I asked. Knowing what drugs were in her system might help me figure out what was going on in her mind. Hannah's arm came out from behind the comforter far enough so that she could point her finger at the dresser. I walked over to the dresser and pulled open the top drawer. Inside were various containers of sleeping pills, along with several prescription drug containers. I picked up one of the prescription bottles. A tenolol. I read the label out loud before putting it back and picking up another. Metropolol. All the prescription drugs seemed to be beta blockers that were commonly prescribed to treat high blood pressure. Based on the names of the bottles, it was clear these medications were not prescribed for Hannah. Why would a healthy teenager suddenly start taking sleeping pills and blood pressure medication? She's numbing herself to something. But what? If it were a psychological issue, I'd have no choice but to follow through on my threat and have her committed, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more going on here, especially since she thought she'd die if I sent her to the hospital. Hannah's mother told me that she had noticed her daughter acting weird after a night out with her friends. She came home frightened but refused to talk about what had happened. Her mental state continued to decline over the next week, culminating in her self-medicating to cope with whatever was happening to her. That prompted her mother to call the local hospital, where she was given my number. I felt like I had all the pieces of the puzzle except the most important one. What happened to Hannah before she came home that night? While I was looking around Hannah's room, I noticed her cell phone sitting on the nightstand. I didn't think I'd be able to get anything out of her in the state that she was in. But I might be able to get it out of her friends. I left Hannah's room and walked into the kitchen, where her mother was sitting at the breakfast table, staring out into the backyard. She didn't seem to notice me standing there, so I cleared my throat to get her attention. Sorry, Mrs. Geller said. I guess I was zoning out there. It's understandable, I replied. You've had a lot to deal with over the past week, and having your husband out on deployment isn't making it any easier for you. I pointed at the picture of her husband, wearing his dress blues, hanging over the couch in the living room. I could see her eyes start to tear up at the mention of her husband. I have a question, I said, trying to change the subject and keep Mrs. Geller from succumbing to the emotions welling up inside her. I was hoping to talk to one of the kids that was with Hannah the night that you said that she came home acting weird. Do you happen to have the contact information for any of them? Mrs. Geller swiped her eyes as she got up and walked over to the counter where her purse was. I have Bailey's number, she said, pulling out her phone. She and Hannah have been friends since grade school. If she wasn't with Hannah that night, then she probably knows who was. I pulled my phone out and started dialing Bailey's number as Mrs. Geller held her phone out so that I could read the contact information displayed on it. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to step outside, I said, walking towards the front door of the house before she could reply. When I stepped out onto the porch, I pushed the little green phone icon to connect the call. Hello? The girl who answered sounded wary, 
likely because she didn't recognize my number. Bailey, I asked, wanting to confirm that I was talking to the right person. Yeah, she replied. Who is this? My name's Dr. Morgan. Uh, Hannah Gellis is a patient of mine. Is Hannah okay? Bailey asked before I could say anything else. The concern in her voice sounded genuine. No, she, she's not. That's why I'm calling you. She's been self-medicating, uh, keeping herself sedated. And no one seems to know why. Her mother thinks it's because of something that happened to her last Friday night. Would you happen to know anything about that? Bailey? I asked after a few moments of silence, wondering if she'd hung up on me. Nobody did anything to her, she finally responded. She just started freaking out. Where were you when she started freaking out? Bailey went silent again. A clear indication that she and Hannah were someplace they weren't supposed to be. I'm not looking to get anyone in trouble. I just want to help Hannah. And I can't do that if I don't know what happened that night. It was the truth. I just hope that she believed me. We were at the old Salt Creek Cemetery, she finally admitted. I knew the place well. It was the oldest cemetery in the area, as well as a historical landmark. It was located on the outskirts of town and was part of the Salt Creek National Park. If they were there after hours, they were trespassing on federal land. What were you doing there? I assumed they went to the cemetery to drink and maybe smoke a little weed, but I was surprised by Bailey's response. I found my mom's old Ouija board in the garage, she said. We thought it would be fun to try it out at the cemetery. If I had known Hannah would react the way she did, I never would have suggested going. Did Hannah freak out before or after you used the Ouija board? After. We were packing up to leave, and she just started screaming, claiming that she saw something on the other side of the cemetery. At first we thought that she was joking, but, but when we couldn't calm her down, we left and we brought her home. I haven't really talked to her much since. You should talk to Chase. Hannah called him up a few days ago, asking him to get her some pills. I can get you his number if you want. No, I don't think that'll be necessary, I replied. You've been very helpful, Bailey. Thank you. I hung up the phone and walked back into the house. Hannah and her friends were messing with forces they didn't understand, and now she was paying the price. The only way I was going to be able to help her is if I found out what she saw, and only she could tell me that. I walked down the hall and straight into Hannah's room, ignoring her mother's questions about my phone call to Bailey. What did you see, Hannah? I said, pulling the comforter off her as I sat on the bed next to her. Go away. She tried to cover her head back up. I need you to tell me what you saw that night in the cemetery. I pulled the comforter out of her grasp and tossed it onto the floor. She rolled over, leaning out of bed to fumble with the drawer on the nightstand. After she got it open, she pulled out a notebook and threw it at me. I picked it up from where it fell on the floor, and I began flipping through the pages, stopping when I came to the last one. Oh shit, Hannah, I said, looking down at the sketch that she had made. I thought this was going to be a simple case of banishing a vengeful spirit. But it was worse. Much worse. There was no mistaking the creature that she had drawn. Its malformed body was skinless and covered in a network of external veins that roped around its thick arms and legs. Instead of a head, it had two large, fleshy tubes jutting out of its chest. The damn thing reminded me of an anthropomorphic human heart. There was only one entity that looked like that. How in the hell did you get tangled up with a heartbeater? Well, that wasn't the creature's name. Uh, it was a nickname given to the species because it sounded better than calling it a core pulsatory, which was the name that they were given when they were first documented thousands of years ago in Europe. Hannah and her friends must have caught the creature's attention that night at the cemetery. The hell was it doing out there at the Salt Creek National Park? In all the years I've been an abnatural psychologist, I've never encountered a heartbeater. I didn't know anyone who had. I wasn't sure how to best proceed. Think, I said to myself. What do you know about the heartbeater? I began to make a mental list. 
It feeds off fear. Uh, a heart beater will use its grotesque appearance to torment its prey. At first, it'll appear sporadically and at a distance, but over time, it'll show up more often and more closer until it's ready to feed off its victim's greatest fear. The fear of death. Hannah must have been the one showing the most fear that night, and that would have been like a, like a dinner bell to the heart beater. It's a harmonic hunter. A heartbeater will sync up the pulsing rhythm of its body with that of its intended victim's heartbeat. Once synced, the heartbeater is relentless in its pursuit. I don't know how Hannah figured it out, but it was a smart move on her part to start taking those beta blockers and sleeping pills. Those medications disrupted the link that she had with the creature, making it harder for it to stalk her. But she wouldn't be able to keep that up for much longer. The drugs were taking their toll on her body. It's ethereal. The heartbeater never fully enters the material plane when it's stalking its intended victim. The only time it fully crosses over is when it comes to feast on the victim's greatest fear, killing the person in the process. This is the only time it's vulnerable. It's always close. A heartbeater keeps a close watch on its intended victim, and was certainly in the room with Hannah and me watching us. It has no known weaknesses. So if a heartbeater has a weakness, nobody has discovered what it is. Just because I know when it will be vulnerable doesn't mean I'll be able to kill it, or sever its link with Hannah. That was all I could recall about the heartbeater. It wasn't much, but it was enough to make me realize there was only one way I was going to be able to help Hannah get out of this mess. And I didn't like it one bit. I pulled my phone and scrolled through my contacts until I found the number I was looking for. My plan to help Hannah wasn't something I could accomplish on my own. I needed help. Hey, what do you want, Doc? Trevor said when he answered the phone. He sounded slightly annoyed. What makes you think I want something? I replied, as innocently as I could. You only call when you want us to help you with something, something that's usually unethical and illegal. Is that more again? I heard Jesse in the background, followed by the sound of a brief struggle. Hey, Doc! Jesse said a moment later, having wrestled the phone from Trevor. Don't mind him, whatever it is, we'd love to help. What do you need us to do? How soon can you come to this address? I asked, giving her directions to Hannah's house. Fifteen minutes. Is that fast enough? That's perfect, I said, hanging up the phone. Now that help was on the way, I needed to get Hannah's mother out of the house. Was Bailey able to help you? Mrs. Geller asked when I walked back into the kitchen. Yes, she was a big help. Thank you for giving me her number, I said, taking the seat across from her. She smiled at me. We couldn't hold her for long before she broke down and started crying. Everything's going to be fine, I said to her, hoping that would be the case. In fact, there's something you can do to help. I pulled the prescription pad out of my purse and began writing on it. Me? Mrs. Geller sounded surprised as she wiped her eyes and tried to compose herself. Do you think you could run down to the pharmacy and fill these prescriptions? I asked, tearing off the sheet and holding it out to her. Yeah, I could do that, she said, rising out of her seat with a sense of purpose. I got up and walked with her to the front door. Is she really going to be okay? She asked, turning to face me as she walked outside. I nodded and placed my hand on her shoulder to reassure her. I really hope so, I said to myself, watching her walk down the porch steps and over to her car. I didn't think she'd respond well if I told her the truth. Based on my estimates, I put my chances of success at probably about 50%. Jesse and Trevor arrived ten minutes later. I walked outside to meet them as Trevor pulled the ambulance he was driving into the now vacant driveway. Bring your bags, I said to them as they got out of the vehicle. And the defibrillator! Hey, nice to meet you too, Doc, Trevor said, walking to the back of the ambulance to grab their gear. As the three of us walked back into the house, I explained the situation to them and what I was planning on doing to save Hannah. Does a mother know about any of this? Trevor asked. I answered his question with a look. I forget I asked, he said. The less I know, the better. Stopping such a dick, Jessie said, slapping the back of her hand across Trevor's chest. Go help the girl, she said, handing me her bag and defibrillator. We'll be out here if you need us. Thank you, I said, walking into Hannah's room and closing the door behind me. I put the bag on the floor next to the bed and powered up the manual defibrillator, setting it within easy reach. Then I pulled out a vial of epinephrine and filled two syringes. Hannah was lying on her bed, the comforter still on the floor where I'd thrown it. I wish I had time to explain, I said to her, cleaning a spot on her thigh with an alcohol wipe. 
but you're just going to have to trust me. As I spoke, I injected the epinephrine into her leg. The effects of the drug were almost instantaneous. Hannah gasped as her eyes flew open. She sat up and looked at me. What have you done? She yelled, looking around the room anxiously. I'm trying to save you, I replied, grasping her wrist so I could feel her pulse. It was high, but not high enough. I uncapped the other syringe and jabbed it into her thigh, pressing the plunger. Sorry, I apologized, backing away from her. Hannah stood up, trying to run out of the room, but I stepped in front of the door, stopping her. It's coming, she spat into my face as she tried to push me out of the way. Her eyes were wide with fear. I know, I said, grabbing her arms. My pills! I need my pills! Hannah kept chanting, tugging herself free and running towards the dresser. I grabbed her around the wrist and pulled her away before she could get the drawer open, retracting her back towards the center of the room. I was about to tell her that she couldn't stay medicated forever, but I didn't get the chance. She was ripped out of my arms as the heartbeater materialized. Grabbing Hannah by the throat, she clawed frantically at its massive fist, choking as it lifted her off the floor. I was thrown back when the heartbeater grabbed Hannah, landing on my ass, and there I sat, stunned by the creature's sudden appearance. None of the pictures I'd seen had prepared me for the true horror of its visage. Worse yet was the smell that accompanied it. It smelled like, like blood and raw meat, but amplified to an unbearable degree. I could feel the bile rising in the back of my throat. The heartbeater continued to squeeze the life out of Hannah. If the pulsing of the creature's body was truly linked to Hannah's heartbeat, that meant she didn't have much time left. The pulses had become weak and irregular. What's that smell? Trevor called out, pounding on the bedroom door. Everything okay in there? Don't open the door! I yelled, finally coming back to my senses. Get your ass moving, Morgan, I thought to myself, crawling across the floor to where I'd left the defibrillator. I cranked the voltage as high as it would go and pulled the paddles free from the machine. I stood up and thrust the paddles against the back of the creature and pressed the charge buttons, delivering a massive shock to the heartbeat. The heartbeater exploded. I dropped the paddles and raised my arms to protect myself from the expected torrent of blood and guts that were about to rain down on me. But it never came. When I lowered my arms, all that remained of the creature was a red mist. It was slowly dissipating. Hannah lay on the floor where she fell when the heartbeater exploded and she wasn't moving. Hannah! I cried out, running over to her. I checked for her pulse but couldn't feel it. I immediately started doing CPR. Help! I yelled. Get out of the way, Trevor said, pushing me to the side so that he can get to Hannah and do his job. Why don't you step outside, Doc? Jesse said helping me to my feet and guiding me to the bedroom door. We got this. I walked down the hall in a daze. When I got to the kitchen, I dropped into the chair that I had been sitting in earlier. It was times like this that made me question if I was doing the right thing. If the heartbeater didn't kill her, the drugs would have, the voice of reason whispered in the back of my mind. At least you tried. I let my head fall into my hands as I questioned every decision I'd made that afternoon, wondering if there was something I could have done differently. I felt a hand on my shoulder. We got her back, Jessie said. I looked up at her, wiping my eyes, wondering if I had heard her correctly. She smiled and nodded her head, confirming that Hannah was alive. She's not out of the woods yet, Jessie said. She needs to go to the hospital. Take her to Eastside General, I said. Ask for Dr. Cullen. I'll call ahead and let him know that you're coming. Don't you want to ride along with us? She asked. I shook my head. I need to stay here. Come up with something to tell her mother. I'll check in on her later. Assuming that she's willing to see me after this. Hey, what's taking so long? Trevor called from the bedroom. I'm coming! Jesse called back. Don't get your panties in a bunch! Jesse walked outside and returned a couple minutes later with a stretcher. I stayed out of the way as they scurried Hannah and loaded her into the back of the ambulance. Yeah, you one lucky son of a bitch, Doc, Trevor said, after closing the ambulance doors. But one of these days, your luck's gonna run out. And when that day comes, I hope I'm not there to see it. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or listening to tonight's podcast on the podcast, if you're listening to that there at Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you can happen to listen to podcasts. I wanted to remind you guys also that my wife sells loose leaf tea 
at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. She has different teas, including creepy pasta teas, and you can get a Mr. Creepy Pasta tea. If you ask for a dabbing sticker, she also has those. And of course, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who checks out patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta and supports the show, keeps the light on, gives me treats for my now two cats, both Hylas and Hercules. Both of them are a handful. And especially a big thank you to Haha Saha, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mazakin, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chabinsky, Nico Kao, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Hades Nephew, Carter Barenfanger, Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradney Lipe, The Government Monitoring System, Anne Charon, Rumble Fox, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Rafael Rodriguez, Dan Sweet, Mad Marshdomp, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Sean Mills, Brian Arce, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Somber Puppet, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Patrick Schoolmeister, Thomas Burgett, Barbara Maceo, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, The Homeless Bird 93, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, and Corey X Kenshin. A big thank you to all of you guys and everybody down there in the description. I really can't thank you guys enough for supporting the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody who listens, sweet dreams. <laughs>